Welcome into episode number two of the Woodpeckers Baseball Podcast, the official podcast of the Advanced A affiliate of the Houston Astros. This is episode number two for the week of May the 17th through the 23rd. And again, I'm your host, Matt Dean, broadcaster for the Fayetteville Woodpeckers. So as we sit here in this week of May 17th through the 23rd, uh, not a ton new going on in terms of news in the sports world. We're still waiting on an announcement by Major League Baseball on a potential plan moving forward with for an abbreviated 2020 season. Uh, We will look back at a few key highlights from the 2019 season as well uh, as look in on the Woodpeckers simulated 2020 season that we've been using on Out of the Park Baseball 21 and two great guests that we have on the program uh, for the second episode of the Woodpeckers Baseball Podcast. We'll be joined by a leading pitcher on last year's record-setting Fayetteville Woodpeckers staff. That's Sean Dubin, who finished with 132 strikeouts and led the Carolina League on what was a top-to-bottom, absolutely dominant Woodpeckers pitching staff in season at number one for the new franchise. We're also joined by another exciting guest, Justin Mitchell, the deputy garrison commander at Fort Bragg. He's a big baseball fan, and we'll get some info on him checking in on the status of Fort Bragg in the Fayetteville community uh, as well. So two great guests coming up, uh, but we will check in uh, first on kind of what would have been uh, this week, the last couple of weeks, if the Woodpecker season had gone on as scheduled. We'll look at some of the promotional highlights uh, that would have been happening this past Saturday on the 16th would have been superhero night at Segra Stadium uh, with a Bunker Batman bobblehead giveaway to the first thousand fans. Uh, this upcoming Sunday, uh, the 17th, or we should say last Sunday, the 17th, would have been Alzheimer's Awareness Day with a purple hat giveaway to the first 1,200 fans, especially purple uniforms uh, for Alzheimer's Awareness uh, would have been auctioned off game-worn jerseys uh, the Woodpeckers would have worn uh, on this past Sunday. Uh, just a couple of promo highlights. Uh, also, we'll do our uh, weekly Woodpeckers flashback, uh, our moment of the week from the 2019 season This time comes to you from May the 19th of 2019 when three Woodpeckers each collected three hits and Johan Ramirez and Hunter Martin combined for a one-hit shutout of the Carolina Mudcats on a Sunday afternoon at Segra Stadium. Miguel Angel Sierra and Jake Adams each tallied their sixth homers of the season to open up the scoring both in the third inning in what was an eventual 11-0 win for the Woodpeckers. Again, coming May the 19th of 2019 our Woodpeckers weekly flashback for the week of May 17th through the 23rd. So without further ado, we will take you to our first guest. As we said, a right-handed pitcher and leader of a dominant Woodpeckers pitching staff in 2019. Our conversation with Sean Dubin, Astros prospect, coming up on the other side. All right, and excited to welcome our next guest. He is a right-handed pitcher uh, for the Fayetteville Woodpeckers last season. Sean Dubin, after three games uh, with the Quad City River Bandits, uh, got called up to Fayetteville where he finished the season pitching in 22 games in the club's inaugural season. Led the Carolina League with 132 strikeouts despite pitching in fewer than 100 innings. He had a 3.92 ERA, uh, also fourth in the Astros minor league organization with his 151 total strikeouts on the season. So, Sean, thanks for being here and, and taking some time to be with us on the Fayetteville Woodpeckers podcast. Yeah, man, absolutely. Thank you for having me. So just to get us started, tell us a, a little about kind of what you've been doing, um, where you hold up right now during uh, the pandemic, and how have you been able to kind of stay sharp, stay in shape, get some work in during this isolation period? Uh, well, first off, I'm back in uh, New York, uh, southwest New York. Uh, the weather's not really too too hot. It's sunny here, but it's like 50 degrees, you know. Um, but, you know, as as far as what I've been doing, you know, just playing video games, uh, you know, getting some of that in. And then I actually went down to uh, Lexington, Kentucky to get some workouts in and uh, some throwing program uh, stuff done. So... You know, just been trying to stay on top of everything. It's tough up here in the cold weather, but, you know, just doing the best. 
and I want to get into a little bit about your collegiate career uh, in a little bit, but uh, you pitched for one of your seasons kind of near Lexington when you went to Georgetown College. Do you still have some connections down there with some guys that brought you down there? Yeah, that's part of it. Um, you know, the the whole coaching staff there, you know, they they really welcomed me with open arms and, you know, they still do a lot for me. They let me get on my training there, you know, basically whatever I need. So, you know, it's a good spot for me to, to go during the off season. Yeah, you had a pretty uh, circuitous college career. You, you pitched at three different programs, uh, got started out at Erie Community College in 2015. Uh, we'll, we'll start with there. When you were kind of coming out of high school, uh, you know, you're, you're up north. Uh, it's not a spot where you traditionally think of baseball players coming from. Did you have a lot of other offers somewhere? Did you go into Erie Community College, you know, hoping that it would help you springboard into a D1 offer of some kind? Yeah, I knew at that point, I knew that was probably my only shot if I wanted to pursue baseball because, uh, you know, that fall I had gone to an open tryout that one of my friends, you know, he was on the team and he asked me if I wanted to come, you know, to show off my stuff to the coach. And, uh, you know, I only had a semester to do it, the, the spring semester, but, uh, you know, I kind of just took it with like a chip on the shoulder. I, I knew that if I didn't do that, my mom would have let me uh, – she wouldn't let me keep chasing the baseball dream. She wanted me to get my bachelor's degree somewhere. So, you know, that was kind of my mindset there. Yeah, so open yes, tryout ended up working out for you. Uh, you landed a spot uh, with Buffalo, which I imagine probably the, the closest Division One program to your, your hometown. Um, you're in Allegheny. Um, spent a couple of seasons there. You left Buffalo uh, largely because they, they disbanded the baseball program after your second season there. Uh, so what's that like? I mean, being at a program where, uh, you know, it's it's close to your hometown. It kind of felt like a spot you probably wanted to be in, being in Division One, being relatively close to home. And then when did you kind of start to hear that they were going to be getting rid of baseball? And what was your reaction to that? Yeah, you know, it was pretty cool. Um, I could have went to St. Bonaventure, which is the, the local college here. But, you know, I kind of want to get out and explore a little bit. And I loved Buffalo from when I was in uh, when I was at ECC. So, um you know, the experience there was great, but we uh, we actually found out after a road series at uh, Kent State, you know, we just got a text saying meet in the auditorium tomorrow morning. And then they just announced probably like midway through the season that um, it was going to get canceled. So then everyone started freaking out, uh, trying to find places to go. And then it was just a weird setup because during the season, all these coaches are trying to get a hold of all these players. So it's just hard to maintain that focus at that point. But you know, still a good, good experience. When that news comes down, I mean, w w what's the process? Do you start trying to make some calls or send some texts? Do, do people start reaching out to you, uh, you know, coaches from other programs? And then how does a guy from New York get connected to Georgetown, Kentucky? And how'd you end up there? Well, one of the, uh, the old volunteer assistants at Buffalo happened to, uh, he got a job down there. His name was Randy Guy, And, uh, he really helped me out, you know. Um, my grades weren't too hot going uh, going into my senior year, but um, you know, he really, like I said, they opened me or welcomed me with open arms, and you know, he pulled some strings for me. Really cool. And what was appealing about the program too? Obviously, you had the connection there. Uh, you still go back to, to get some work in there, so you obviously have some ties and, and were impressed with what they were doing. What stood out to you about about going to the NAIA and, and with Georgetown in particular? You know, um, honestly, just the, the level of play there, you know, um, you get a lot of D1 kickbacks, you know, there's a lot of good talent there that kind of gets unseen. So I feel like, you know, it's a good feeling. A guy like me coming from the NAIA, just try to get a little bit more spotlight on that. We talked about how, you know, you're from New York, so you maybe had to do a little bit more to get attention in that regard. You spent, ended up spending your last college season in NAIA, which, you know, you just said is is not as, as well known um, uh, for scouting the talent. And then and then you yourself, you maybe aren't the prototypical embodiment of a pitcher. You, you got some height, you're six one, but you're a little bit smaller than I think what a lot of people would think of for a pitcher. So do you feel like that's kind of always been a battle for you to kind of, you have to work a little extra harder or do a little bit more to, to be noticed? Yeah, absolutely. You know, you got to, I guess to that point, you know, just let the natural abilities take over. But um you know, obviously, you try to work a little harder. You see all these guys, they're a little bit bigger, you know. But, uh, you know, I just look at it as a little bit of motivation. So, you know, hopefully we'll get there soon. And then as you've gone pro, the, obviously the Astros are really good at 
at scouting unseen talent, maybe sometimes getting the most out of uh, the talent of a lot of guys. So what have you learned about, you know, your physical skills and your skill set that, that makes you stand out and unique? What have you learned from them about that? Man, I don't even know where to start with that. Um, just everything in general, you know, strength wise, uh, you know, a lot of stuff I didn't know that was possible. Um, like stuff just as simple as my eating habits. I think that was the biggest switch for me was just trying to force myself to start eating more, you know, and trying to get as many calories as you can. But they do a great job at providing you with the information that we need. Um, you know, they, they really just make it um, a lot easier for the players. Um, and then as far as the pitching side, you know, I think from where I was at, at the end of college, where I'm at now is just light years better. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can just keep advancing. And one of the exciting things about you is your strikeout totals have kind of steadily increased every year. You were striking out like eight per nine in your last year at Buffalo. You had a monster season, 12 Ks per nine and at Georgetown. And then it went up even more than that a little bit last year when, when you led the league in strikeouts with Fayetteville. Uh, obviously, you had some huge strides going pro and, and working with the Astros. But, you know, was that a lot of like physical improvement uh, or you just kind of getting used to uh, to, to your delivery, like what were those kind of stages going like Buffalo and AIA and then going pro What were like some big strides you took in, in those strikeouts going on? Yeah, I think just fine tuning the mechanics, you know, um, getting a feel for all my pitches, you know, release points, all that. And then as far as, you know, just, I was kind of a, a late grower, you know, I, uh, kind of made a little bit of a jump weight wise and, you know, I see it as like an improvement and, you know, hopefully you know, to like 180 by the end of the season. Great. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you too, for fans out there that, you know, in Fayetteville, for example, we it's minor league baseball's back after a, you know, 12 year plus hiatus. People aren't as familiar with, with minor league baseball, and maybe the levels. I think one thing that maybe goes unnoticed by fans is like how close, you know, a ball advanced a ball is to the big leagues. Do you feel that? you know, when you're pitching for Fayetteville, you're trying to stay in the moment, obviously, and just work to get better every day. But does it always feel like, you know, a few cards can fall, there's an injury, or there's an opportunity to move up? Does it feel like right now in your career, you are, you know, at the doorstep of getting to the big leagues? Yeah, I think so. You know, obviously, there's still, there's always room for improvement. But, you know, I think everything is starting to come together, especially after the season last year, everything just kind of clicked for me. And, um, you know, I'm really excited to see where it goes. It's uh, unfortunate that we couldn't see how the season played out, but, you know, hopefully we can soon. Yeah, one of the things, like, I, I was just watching one of your starts from last season, a couple innings, getting ready for this, and the one game I happened to click on, it was against the Winston-Salem Dash, and so, like, you were facing Nick Madrigal. You got him to ground out. And so, like, I mean, there's guys like that where, you know, if there was baseball being played right now, if they hopefully get the major league season starting soon, like, we could see Nick Madrigal in the big leagues pretty feasibly this year guys like that you know as you move up how, how cool is that to get to see guys where it's like wow this guy's really good chance of getting into the big leagues yeah at this point. it's pretty awesome you know it's surreal at the same time you know especially coming from this background it's uh you know you just gotta cherish every moment all right one of the things too uh i wanted to check in with you about i was looking back through some of your old profile shots your your bios in college you, you've kind of always at buffalo you still had the beard going on you had it going pretty good last year in your Fayetteville headshot. Like, how long has that been a staple uh, of your look? You also had a pretty elite mullet, too, I saw at Buffalo. Uh, and any any plans to bring that back as a trademark? Uh, it's possible, you know, especially uh, with the beard getting a little thicker and longer as the years go on. I feel like, uh, you know, maybe a, a midseason turnaround might need to shave the mullet in. Everybody kind of has like a quarantine beard right now, but this is basically just you maintaining what you've been doing for the last like four plus years, basically, right? Exactly. Yeah, I try to do a little upkeep on it every now and then, but just kind of let it go. One of the things I saw in your Buffalo bio uh, too is you had a couple of your favorite athletes listed. Uh, one, you're a snowboarder, so you're a big fan of Sean White. I think one of my like favorite live sporting events I watched is when he got the perfect score in the half pipe or whatever. That's awesome. How did you get into snowboarding and what do you, what do you like about Sean White? Um, you know, just being, like I said, from Southwest New York, there's a, a big ski resort called Holiday Valley. And, uh, it's like a, two towns over like a 20 minute drive. And, uh, 
you know, a lot of people flock from or to that area from all around. And just growing up next to it, I used to go every winter, you know. Um, in school, we had certain, uh, like, extracurricular activities that we could just go up. So, you know, just growing up around it, it just really kind of molded me. And like I said, Sean White at the time, he was so fun to watch. And any, I'm sure any other snowboarder would, would say that they were his favorite. And then on the baseball side, you listed your favorite pitchers. Uh, he was on the Tigers last year, got traded to Atlanta Braves, Shane Green. That's like kind of an obscure pick. Like that's a good back-end bullpen guy. But what do you admire or like about Shane Green? Kind of grew up a little bit of a Yankees fan, you know, just watched their games. They were always on. And when he played for the Yankees, I just used to always think, you know, I just picked out certain qualities of him and just found similarities. And, you know, I used to always compare my game to him and, uh, you know, I'm sure nowadays if I could update it, I would choose someone else. But, I mean, for a long time there, I kind of try to embody his game. You were really hit your stride and figured something out, especially late in the season. You, you finished the year in an 18-inning scoreless streak. You had a great start in a winner-take-all game five in the semifinal series, six innings, one run ball on the road against Down East. You know, what clicked for you at that moment in the season? And then how much fun was it for you to kind of have your best individual success when it mattered most for the team, you know, chasing down the playoff spot and then in that big playoff series? Yeah, I think just having a pitching coach like Thomas Whitsett, um, you know, he really he was working with, with me all year and we were trying out different things because, uh, you know, just something didn't feel natural throughout the season. And finally, we found that one thing that clicked and, you know, just kind of took it and ran with it. And, you know, he was super supportive or supportive and uh you know, encouraging about it. So, and then to hit that stride late in the season like that, that was, you know, that was something pretty crazy. Something I enjoyed a lot too. You know, it was fun when we were winning. Just the vibes in the, the clubhouse were at all time high. Okay, last thing I got for you during, you know, this period where you should be pitching, should be playing right now, but, you know, we're waiting for that time for baseball to come back when it's safe. How are you, you know, scratching your competitive edge? Like, what are you doing to kind of get some competition in? Are you playing video games? Are you getting really into that? Like, what are you doing to to compete like you're you're used to doing this time of year? Yeah, you know, video games, try to put a limit on it and stuff. Um, but, I mean, just in my bullpens, my throwing programs, I just try to visualize, you know, different situations, try to put myself into, you know, tough situations. And, um I think that helps a lot. We, our mental skills program really does an excellent job of, you know, trying to get us to, you know, imagine things and put out, put it or put ourselves in a certain situation. So I think they just really make it easy for us in all aspects. All right. Very cool. Again, I want to thank our guest, right-handed pitcher for the Fayetteville Woodpeckers last season, Sean Dubin. Uh, Sean, stay safe, uh, stay well. We hope to see you back in the field, wherever that is, and hopefully sometime soon in, in 2020. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you again for having me. All right, and my next guest is the Deputy Garrison Commander at Fort Bragg. He's been here since June of 2014, uh, originally from Dawson County in eastern Montana, uh, and a former graduate of the United States Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. My guest is Justin Mitchell here with us on the Woodpeckers Baseball Podcast. Justin, thanks for taking some time and being here with us today. Hey, no problem, Matt. I, I look forward to having the discussion with you, and I look even more forward to getting the baseball season going. Absolutely. The first thing that, that you were just touching on before we before we started here, just for our listeners who, who aren't as familiar with, with the structure at Fort Bragg, tell us a little bit about your role and an overview kind of of your role as it relates to Fort Bragg. So the, the deputy garrison commander at, at an army installation is, is like a city manager in any normal municipality. And so uh, Fort Bragg is actually the, the largest U.S. military installation in the, in the whole world based on population. And so we have about 54,000 soldiers here and, and about 200,000 family members for a supported population, which makes us, uh, with the retirees, uh, the fifth largest city in North Carolina. And so it, it's, a, it's a pretty massive installation with the Joint Special Operations Command, United States Special Operations Command, uh, so, some Air Force Special Operators. Forcecom, which is a four-star commander, and then the senior commander of Fort Bragg is a three-star general named Eric Carrilla, who I take direction from basically every single day. But 
But so uh, I'm, I'm like the city manager of a city, but it's all military and family members. And right now, things obviously different than what we'd expected they would be right now, pretty much everywhere, and, and including in your role. I, I would have to imagine uh, it's a little bit different on base in just that in the civilian side, we're hearing about North Carolina getting ready to move forward into phase two. Okay, what does that mean? What, how is that going to change? I'd imagine there's a lot more contingencies in place. You maybe didn't expect this pandemic to break out at this time, uh, but how are things different on base and kind of obviously the reaction, I would imagine, is pretty different versus how it would be on the civilian side as things have kind of changed and there's a lot of uncertainty right now. Yeah, I, I think that there's some differences, but I think there's a lot of similarities too. You know, we stay, uh, I stay in contact with the, the North Carolina Military Affairs Committee. And in fact, last week we were actually on the phone with, with Governor Cooper to talk about when, you know, and what he's looking for phase two. And, and we're trying to follow along with phase one in terms of what we're opening. So very similar, you know, our barbershops are closed, our swimming pools are closed, our gyms are closed and things like that. We are still providing childcare and things like that because Fort Bragg can't close. We're, we are the nation's contingency force. And so uh, we have the immediate response force. If, if we get a call, uh, there's people from Fort Bragg that within two hours are on their way, but within 18 hours, uh, we, we need to have a brigade size element, about 5,000 folks on planes ready to, to do a joint forced entry. And so go to a place maybe that we're not welcome uh, take over something like an airstrip and then get ready for follow on forces after that. And so we we don't close. And so there's people training all the time. There's people deploying and redeploying. We had a, a very large contingent go to Iraq on uh, New Year's Eve while you all were at a, a party. We called our soldiers back, put them on planes and they were in Iraq. And now we start, we're starting to receive them back. And so when soldiers come back from deployment or, or frankly, from anywhere that's a hot spot or anywhere outside of the United States, we put them in quarantine for 14 days before we allow them back into the general population. So, you know, there's a lot of things that are different, but there's a lot of things that are the same. And right now, people are kind of wondering, you know, what the expectations are for when things are going to return to normal. It obviously isn't just going to turn on a dime and go back to how it was beforehand. But, you know, what's kind of the, the feeling or the expectations for when things are going to kind of slowly ease back to a more normal day to day operation moving forward here these next few months? Well, that's a that's a great question. You know, the, the great thing about uh, being around the Department of Defense is we have a lot of researchers, a lot of ORSAs and people that, that do a lot of analytics. And so it's going to be a database decision. And as we track positives for COVID on Fort Bragg, we, we just shy of 100 of them. But as like the normal population, uh, 72 of them have already recovered. And so throughout the, the process, but we, we're doing a lot of analytics. And when when the, the number of positives flatline and when we believe that we have a, a steady state, that's when we'll start to, uh, as my boss caught, pull levers to, to relax the standards. I know people are getting stir crazy. A lot of people are, are getting ready to move out and we've already relaxed a little bit in terms of local travel. and and uh, But we still have restrictions like gatherings and facial coverings, hand washing. And we call it physical distancing because we, we need to be social animals, but we do uh, actually consistently enforce the physical distancing. Yeah, definitely a good way to put it. And we're not going to spend the whole time talking about everything that's that's going on at this time of year. It is good to have an update kind of about what's going on in Fort Bragg as it relates to the Fayetteville community for sure. Uh, we mentioned it too. You, you yourself uh, are originally from Montana. You've kind of gotten to globe trot a little bit, go all around the country kind of in your current role. Um, what made you kind of want to go into the service uh, initially? And then one particular experience uh, looking into your background I thought was interesting. Uh, you got to uh, serve as a garrison commander in Germany for several years before you eventually led your way to Fayetteville. So what was that experience like going over to Germany as well, too? Well, I, I tell you, as a, as a, you know, a country kid that grew up in Montana and, and it's much like Wisconsin, as, as you might know, and, uh, you know, the, the cool thing was uh, getting the opportunity to, to see the world and get paid to do it. My, both my children were born in Japan at Yokota Air Base, and uh, then we got to move to Germany and uh, just being a, a young couple that, that kind of got to see the world and and have opportunities to travel and, and work in different cultures and, and see different uh, dynamics of cultures. And, you know, it, it all boils down to we're all we're all human beings and we're all trying to do the best we can in our situations. And for those of us that are parents, we're all trying to be the best parents that we can be 
to set our kids up to have a better future than we did. And and so Germany Germany was very good. Um, a little, I guess, a, there's a couple of funny stories. Uh, the first neat story was, you know, one day driving to work in Japan and looking at Mount Fuji and kind of in my head and rolling, how in the world did this Montana country kid get here, you know, looking at Mount Fuji and getting to climb Mount Fuji? And and then, uh, you know, one of the, the bucket list things that I had as a young person, besides playing professional baseball, which I'm, I'm not talented like the people I get to be around when I'm around the woodpeckers, but uh, the uh, skiing in the Swiss Alps was always something that I had on my bucket list. And so one day... Uh, my wife and I went to Ischgl in Austria and we skied up over the top of the mountain and we went and had lunch and, and we saw that the, at the restaurant you could pay in shillings or francs. This was a few days ago uh, before the Euro. And I went, well, that's kind of strange. Why would they say that you could pay in sh shillings? And they said, well, because you're in Switzerland now because we skied over the mountain into Switzerland. And so I had to kind of write <laughs> home about that because, you know, uh, I guess uh, being around the military and getting to, getting to travel, I, I learned a lot more about geography than I studied when I w or paid attention to when I was in school. But yeah, some pretty neat experiences uh, getting to, to travel and see the world. Shifting to baseball a little bit, one of my first experiences with seeing Fort Bragg was on national television when they had the game in Fort Bragg in 2016, uh, the day before Independence Day. Uh, Marlins played the Braves. It was on ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. It was the first major league game ever played in North Carolina. It was the first major league game played on a United States military base. Uh, just such a huge moment in in baseball history, and, and specifically for Fayetteville, it was kind of a great preview of the support that the Woodpeckers would get uh, a few years later. You were, had been in Fayetteville for a couple of years, but what was it like just putting that event together with Major League Baseball, and, and how special was that to, to have that game uh, on Fort Bragg? You know, as crazy as it may sound, you know, in the 26 years I've been doing this kind of business, that and, and I have the picture right here on my desk. If you ever come into my office, you'll see the blown up photograph of that stadium. I, I have to say that was probably the most unique and hard, but absolutely amazing experience I've had in my entire life. I, I just I just got to say that, you know, we got a call in August from Major League Baseball and the, and the Major League Baseball Players Association saying, hey, we'd like to play a baseball game on a military installation. And we'd like to know if you would like it at Fort Bragg. And we said, of course. And then we hang up the, the phone and went, holy cow, what did we just sign up for? Uh, because things don't happen that fast, you know, on a military installation or in a Department of Defense kind of a decision. And so with with an, an incredible support uh, of lots of people, we literally got the the six million dollar gift to the to the Department of Army all the way through my chain of command, approved by Congress and back, started building the field in February and played the game uh, on July uh, 3rd. And uh, I'll tell you that. Just watching the, the way they took care of the stadium, they built the stadium and watching them prepare for the game. I, I unfortunately spent a lot of the game under the deck looking with the, the Air Force Weather Squadron because we had some weather that day. And <laughs> most people don't know it, but we had a, a lightning storm that we were afraid. You know, rain we could play through, but lightning you can't. So we were really afraid that if it got canceled, it, you know, it would never happen again. And, and that so literally most of the game I was up and down the stairs kind of in the weather squadron. And uh, my chaplain had a really good day because he prayed before the game and the uh, weather would roll in to just north of us and then it just seemed to dissipate or it would go around us. And we got to play the whole game without lightning. And again, it was, I, I, I literally was like a little kid in a candy store watching this thing before me and getting to meet some of the players. And, and uh, that, that's something I'll never forget in my entire life. That was, that was a neat event. Yeah, just awesome event. I, I remember seeing it too. Uh, that was obviously a huge moment for uh, for Fort Bragg and, and for baseball back in the city of Fayetteville as a whole. Uh, so moving forward from that experience, you know, what were your reactions? When do you first remember hearing about a minor league team starting to make some ground that they were going to be coming to Fayetteville? I imagine you had to be pretty excited as a fan yourself. You didn't have as much logistical work to do <laughs> for these games to be played. So what was kind of your first memories of, of murmurings of minor league baseball returning to Fayetteville? Well, the, the the neat part about my job is is part of my do job is to work outside the fence line as well. So I have great relationships with with uh, Spring Lake, Moore County, Harnett County, and the whole Sand Hills community, and Fayetteville in particular. And so I, I actually kind of got to be in on some of the ground uh, breaking conversations about, hey, this is what's coming. And, uh, you know, it's funny that, you know, the first president, Mark Zarthur, I was one of the first people that he met when he got here. He, he, he just got his brand new vehicle, just got his apartment. 
and uh, I got him a pass to come on Fort Bragg. And what I did was I, I took him around and I introduced him to some young soldiers. And then basically we would do on the spot surveys saying, hey, what would you like to see in a park or what would make you go to a, a minor league baseball game? And so I, I got to kind of just you know, on the periphery, uh, kind of be a, a part of how this all came together. And, and it, I was very excited from the get go. And there's several people that work for me that, that are season tic- ticket holders. And I've, I've gone to a lot of different games. But I, I really appreciate the Woodpeckers' just attitude towards families, and what I've experienced with them, with their family night, with their different different spotlight nights, with their honoring our military nights, uh, with their faith night on a Sunday night, doing a concert and testimonies. And I, actually, I got to do a testimony, and then two of the Woodpeckers players that I met and got to know a little bit through Baseball Chapel got to do their testimonies that night, and it, it really. To me, the family orientation, and it just happens to be a really great baseball experience while you're there, it has been just huge. And, and I know that uh, the base uh, embraces it, as does the city. Last thing I got for you uh, before we let you go, Justin, uh, when we get the go-ahead, the green light to, to move forward with, with baseball again uh, and back at Segra Stadium, what are you most looking forward to at a Woodpeckers game? Do you have a spot? Do you have a particular food that you're scoping out? Like, what are you going to do when Segra Stadium reopens? Yeah, I'm just, I'm old school. I guess I'm old, but I'm old school. I love the I love the hot dogs. I usually eat two hot dogs and a Coke. And uh, we, we usually set up the uh, third baseline in, in terms of spots. Most of the time we're right there. Uh, a couple rows back on the third baseline. But then uh, uh, my wife enjoys going up to the recliners in the outfield and, and just kind of hanging out there, uh, particularly on a nice day and sun, sun tanning and, and watching the game from left field. And so we'll go up and we'll sit in the couches in the recliners and just relax and just really enjoy a, a phenomenal day of baseball. And, you know, they did an amazing job this year. What a, what a great season they had. And, and I'll tell you, we, we just enjoyed watching them anywhere in the stadium. But there's not a bad seat. But the, the the recliners have been fun. But third baseline has always been my favorite. Good spot. Uh, again, our guest, the Deputy Garrison Commander at Fort Bragg, Justin Mitchell. Justin, thanks again for being here. Uh, my pleasure, Matt. Look forward to talking to you or seeing you soon. Thanks again to both of our guests, Sean Dubin and Justin Mitchell, for joining us on episode number two of the Woodpeckers Baseball Podcast. A few other loose ends to tie up before uh, we wrap things up here uh, on our second edition of the show. As promised, checking in with the virtual Woodpeckers on Out of the Park Baseball 21. This is a full disclosure podcast. Last time I gave you that update on the Woodpeckers, they were off to a tremendous start in the season. I blew it. I had some computer troubles. It didn't save an OOTP 21. I had to redo the simulation. The Woodpeckers, not quite as dominant in the second go around of the simulated season. They are still in third place uh, heading into action uh, on Sunday. So I've simmed the games through, I think the date is the 25th, roughly uh, coming up, actually the, the, going into the 24th. Uh, they're only a game over 500. The underlying numbers still pretty good. Uh, the team got off to a rough start in April this go around six and twelve uh, in the first month of the season. All but one of the losses were by two runs or fewer. So the Woodpeckers still getting great pitching. The offense has actually performed a lot better this time around. Uh, a few injuries to the pitching staff. They've shuffled around uh, the rosters with some injuries across the org in this simulation. But the Woodpeckers coming into play on Sunday, as we said, they're leading the Carolina League in batting average and on base percentage, second in OPS and third in batting war. So the offense has been great in this go around. Uh, home runs, they've hit 32 of them, which is tied for uh, fifth out of the 10 team at Carolina League. Uh, pitching staff still as dominant as you'd expect. Starters ERA at 4.3s, fourth in the league. Bullpen ERA is just under 3.6. That's the second best mark. Uh, but the underlying numbers, as we alluded to, have been excellent for the Woodpeckers, both on offense and and on the pitching staff, uh, the fielding independent pitching, basically just factoring in the strikeout, walk, and home run totals, best pitching staff uh, in the Carolina League to this point, 3.47. And, no surprise, leading the league with 423 uh, pitching strikeouts on the mound. Freudus Nova has been incredible this season. He's leading the team in his age 21 season with a 360 batting average, six home runs, 
26 runs driven in. He's had an excellent season. Johansi Torres spent about a week on the injured list, but still leading the Fayetteville staff in strikeouts with 40. Uh, Lupe Chavez has three wins leading the staff. He's also got 32 strikeouts. Nivaldo Rodriguez has eclipsed uh, the 30 strikeout mark. Uh, at this point. Jake Myers uh, recently returned to the squad. He's been the primary leadoff hitter. He's batting 345 since returning to Fayetteville. And Manuel Valdez ha- having a great start to the season. He's hitting over 340 in limited action. Uh, so all in all, getting more contributions top to bottom uh, from the lineup. I think on social media, if you follow me at Matt Dean Guy, I'll post some screenshots of the team if you're interested. But that is our OOTP update uh, on the Woodpeckers, they're playing some of their best baseball uh, in OOTP of the season right now, having won uh, five of their last six games heading into action on the road in Frederick uh, Sunday, May the 24th. A uh, few things to update you on uh, on uh, the real world. The Woodpeckers are doing curbside pickup for the online Bird's Nets merchandise store. So if you're some of our fans uh, tuning in from around the Fayetteville area, curbside pickup uh, available every Tuesday from 2 to 6 p.m. Uh, so if you do uh, want to give yourself an errand to get out of the house, pick up those merchandise orders yourself. Of course, always available uh, for delivery uh, on uh, the FayettevilleWoodpeckers.com as well, too. Uh, on social media, stay updated with the Woodpeckers at Woodpeckers NC, Facebook and Instagram. There are going to be face coverings branded Woodpeckers gear coming to the team store pretty soon. Uh, that should be happening over the next couple of weeks. Uh, so something new uh, to keep an eye out for as well uh, to help you during this period of social distancing. That's about all we have for episode number two of the Woodpeckers Baseball Podcast. Uh, We'll be back next week. Again, we already know our player guest is going to be a former Woodpeckers catcher from last season, Scott Manea. So we're excited to sit down and and chat with him over a call and bring that to you next week. So Scott Manea uh, joining us next week on the Woodpeckers Baseball Podcast. We've got some other great guests in the works. Nothing set in stone quite just yet, uh, but we're going to have a a big-name guest or two coming up these next couple of weeks, Uh, so stay tuned for that as well. Uh, We are available now to subscribe on Spotify. Uh, We're still working on getting this podcast up on Apple Podcasts might actually be available by the time this actually gets published, but we should be an Apple podcast pretty soon. Again, just search for Woodpeckers Baseball Podcast. We are on Spotify. We are on Google Podcasts and a few other platforms as well, too. But Apple Podcasts is really the last hurdle that we're trying to overcome uh, and have it available there. So appreciate you listening. Give us a rating. Give us a review. Let us know what you want to hear on the podcast. And we'll try to make that happen as well, too. We appreciate uh, your time, even if you're looking for things to do this time of year. So, again, I'm Matt Dean, the broadcaster for the Fayetteville Woodpeckers. This has been episode number two of the Woodpeckers Baseball Podcast.